Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Society for Applied Microbiology's live Q&A with Professor Dame Sally Davies. Uh, Dame Sally, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Claire Taylor. I'm the Society's General Secretary, and I'm going to be chairing the session. Um, but before we get to our live Q&A, we are going uh, to show you a short video which uh, celebrates uh, Dame Sally's uh, fellowship of SFAM uh, last year. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out on this um, lovely hot June evening with no train strike. We very, we really appreciate you coming. And we're here to award a fellowship to uh, what I consider certainly, and I'm sure you do, uh, a very deserving recipient, and that is uh, Professor Dame Sally Davis. Um, Dame Sally, as you all must know, has played a major role in pushing the whole agenda for the AMR debate forward, making it not only national but global, and making sure that Britain stands front and central um, in that fight. And I'm very proud that we've done that as a country. And thank you, Dame Sally, for pushing that forward. She instigated the O'Neill Report, which has been wide sweeping and caused a number of changes and differences to the way people think. So with that, before I blither on any longer, I'll say thank you very much, Dame Sally, and please accept our fellowship award. Congratulations. Oh, Thank you very much. <laughs> if anyone's got a scepter, we've got the orb. That makes her the queen of AMR, surely. <laughs> That's absolutely beautiful. I love beautiful glass. I'm going to put it in Cambridge in my new office. Fantastic. Thank you. I'm now going to hand over to our early career scientists for a Q&A session. Um, tonight's event is a little bit truncated because Dame Sally has to go off to a ministerial uh, meeting, um, which is unavoidable, but we're still going to have our early career scientists talk to, uh, to Dame Sally and ask her questions and grill her, see what she's learned. <laughs> With that, I will leave you to the early career scientist, and Phil, I think you're going to kick off. Thank you. Uh, thanks for agreeing to sit down with us and be uh, grilled with some interview questions. Um, with me today, I've got Rob, Lucky, and Caleb. Uh, just to start things off, as Mark mentioned, you've been instrumental in bringing AMR to the front of government and uh, healthcare policies, and since then we've reduced the amount of ant antibiotics that we use. Um, are there any other methods you can think of of how we can slow down AMR development? Well, we have to prevent infection, so that's um, infection prevention and control or biosecurity in the animal sector. I don't know what we're calling it in the plant sector, I need to find out. We have to um, use vaccinations, both the ones we've got and develop more. Uh, there's a role for better diagnostics, uh, clearly a role for new drugs. But then, of course, and I'm learning more about this, I was at a meeting in um, Hong Kong last week, we need to control our effluent from factories and hospitals and other uh, and high runoff farms because, of course, animals, including us, pee out 70 to 90 percent of antibiotics. So someone was telling me they found ciprofloxacin in our Thames water that we're drinking. So we've got rather a lot to do in this country, but generally across the world. So what's been the biggest challenge of your career so far, would you say, and how have you overcome it? Apart from the difficult people. Of course. <laughs> Um, I think it, 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 it is always about people. How do you engage them in the things that you think matter when there are so many issues around and for them, how do they prioritize and you have to make it personal and make it matter to them. And th so that's one side, how to engage the politicians to get the political push and support and impetus. But then when you're trying to make change, whether in the health system or the veterinary system, who can really help it happen and how do they do that? Where do they find the space, the resources, the money? I mean, I want to give credit to Pete Borriello here uh, because he worked with the animal industry 
um, to have voluntary targets. And I said, I don't think it'll work, Pete. And he said, leave me to it, it will. And blow me, they've delivered. So I'll quote the chickens, poultry, because I know that one, 71% reduction in antibiotics over four years, 11% rise in uh, protein, and they've gone even better with the latest data we've just got. So it is about the people. How do you persuade them they want to change? How do you incentivize them? But the world is full of difficult people. So, <laughs> so I've got a slightly different question. So you're an inspiration to many women being the first female CMO and now the first Master of Trinity College, female Master of Trinity College. What advice would you give to females starting out their career in science? Oh, go for it. Um, <laughs> so uh, it was quite interesting. I, I was interviewed for the Times about this and I talked about the imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And even now, occasionally, I think, oh, shit, can I d really do this? Will I be able to? Um, and, but you have to, someone told me after that article, uh, uh, the expression, fake it till you make it. Because the problem's in our brains. Yep. It's not in us. Um, in general, men don't suffer from it, though I did get a very interesting, which I haven't shared with even my husband, set of texts from people saying they did share it and they were male and you'd know the names if I told you. So, but fake it till you make it. Get on with it, go for it. And I often say to young women, hold your nose and jump. If there's an opportunity, try it. What can you lose? You make a mess, you learn from the mess. So as Chief Medical Officer, you've been involved in plenty of policy discussions. Are there any policies that you've struggled to practice what you preach? <laughs> yeah, all of them. Um, I would love to be a couch potato, boozing good wine all the time and eating really nice food. Um, that said, I do try and practice what I preach, so I go out twice a week jogging. Um, as much as my tendons will allow, I have some tendonitis. I try to eat, uh, I mean, I eat healthily and I try to eat the right amount, and I do drink within the CMO low-risk guidelines, <laughs> generally. <laughs> but I like a glass of good wine. But I've always been open about that. Um, living a healthy life in our environment is not easy. Our environment uh, pushes us towards unhealthy lives. But um, I try and practice what I preach. Be pretty rotten if I didn't, wouldn't it? What do you um, believe is the biggest threat to human health? After AMR? After AMR. Right. Um, I, uh, I think I'd probably go for obesity, actually. I mean, if only because the tsunami is there and it's really pushing forward. It's associated with a lot of mental ill health. It's associated with so many other problems. So for us, I think it is the non-communicable diseases, and I'd put obesity at the top. Uh, I suppose you could talk about how we're going to feed the ever-increasing population, but we're going to have to change how we live, both to protect our environment but also to protect our health. And I think that sustainability is going to go hand in hand. We, we should eat less meat as a, you know, a population. We should um, eat more vegetables as a population. Those doing that will be good for our health and good for the environment. So I think there's a coming together about planetary health, which where the threats are great, and if only we respond, we will get better lives. Okay, I, I only have uh, one more question for you now, yeah? um, which is, uh, with, have you come across many conflicts with scientific evidence and political ideologies? Oh, yes. Um, I mean, <laughs> it, it's quite interesting that early on I, I wanted to know what the politicians philosophy was, because I thought it would make life easier. But I think politics at the moment is, is not philosophy driven. Uh, so you just have to get on with trying to work through. And what I've tried to do with uh, this role is make it very evidence-based. I've tried to make my USP that it's evidence-based, what I advise, but to recognize that I can give advice but the politician takes the decision. And therefore, 
it's evidence-informed policy, not evidence-based. I don't think evidence-based really exists, except in a, in a, you know, a nirvana, um, because people actually evidence is is a social construct. So what you find is not just ministers, but all sorts of people say, "But my auntie, this happened," or "They said this to me," or "I read in a newspaper," and that for them that's evidence. Whereas for me, randomized controlled trials or very carefully controlled lab studies is evidence. And so somehow we have to work with that, and that's why I talk about evidence-informed policy. But yes, I have disagreed with ministers. I try and do it behind closed doors, um, because for me it's important they know what I think based on the evidence, um, but it's not, I mean, I did once threaten to resign, so it shifted. Um, but only once. You can't play that very often. Well, thank you very much for answering our questions. I hope that wasn't uh, too hard. <laughs> <laughs> That's very kind of you. That was much less hard than I, I feared it might be. Yes. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much again for answering questions for us, Dame Sally. It's much appreciated, um, especially in light of your commitments tomorrow. Um, and thank you guys for asking some great questions. Um, the evening will continue, so please do enjoy a few drinks and some canapes and enjoy and chat to each other. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. So Dame Sally, we have had a number of questions sent in by SFAM members, and um, so we're going to ask you some questions. Um, I'm going to take Chair's privilege and, and ask you the first one, if that's okay. Um, so there was a paper out recently um, which suggested that women that communicate STEM are seen as bossy and emotional. Um, and, and given that there are many initiatives to encourage women into STEM and, and you're a prominent role model, a female role model yourself, what do you think about this? And, and do you think we need to do things differently? I don't think we women need to do things differently, but we need to be seen differently. I think it goes uh, not just across STEM. It, when I talk to senior women in banking or the law and many other subjects, is that me who's disappeared? Yes, it is. Um, can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. <laughs> How interesting. Oh. I don't know what I've done. I wonder um, if your camera's flicked around. Uh, well, I was wondering that, so I, so I was trying to see whether I could turn it back, and then we can turn it. Yeah, I didn't even touch it. There's a, there's a zeitgeist in here, and it's clearly male, because I'm talking about men. So um, when I talk to senior women in um, banking or the law, they have the same problem. And I always felt as I came up through the system that if I got angry, people would say I was hysterical because I was a woman, whereas a man who gets angry is strong. Yeah. And I, so I think it's a societal problem. I don't think it's about STEM. And we have to combat it. And sometimes you can bat it back quite strongly, other times, humour is really powerful. Um, and I, I have used humour a lot. But, you know, if it really goes on from individuals, then you have to talk to their boss or someone and say, this is how I feel and it's really not right. Because most people know it isn't right by now. But they either don't know they're doing it, in which case they can be helped to understand, or... They're looking for a rise and they need taking down. Yeah, I, I think a, a quite a number of people were quite dispirited after reading that article, though. And, and I think many female colleagues of mine sort of felt, oh, you know, why, why do we bother? Yeah, well, you've got to bother. Um, after all, the reason I put Athena Swan uh, into uh, NIHR as a condition for getting some of our big grants was because women make up 51% um, of the population. So you can't afford economically to throw away half the best brains, let alone the fact 
it's not fair. And if there's one thing that brings Britain together, it is the concept of fairness. So we can't let them get away with it. We have to keep going. Um, and I think that means that we're going to have to work with not only your generation, but my own generation. Funnily enough, some of the men get it much more when their own daughters are subjected to some of this. The number of older men, professors and people saying to me, Sally, I didn't know it was like this. Sally, I hadn't understood. And I say, oh, how old's your daughter? 22, 25. Ah, yes, it is. What are you going to do now? Because you're in a position of power. Not in part of that, but separately, I still relish the moment when the former vice chancellor of Cambridge announced, he didn't consult, he just said, we are now going to publish the numbers by gender of people who are being put forward for promotion to professorial grade in the university. And of course, there were very few women being put forward and people complained, said, you can't do that. You can't do that. And he said, yes, I can. I'm not betraying names or anything else. I'm just saying by department, the genders. And that shifted it. Within a year, there were more women being put forward. But we also have to help ourselves. So, um, you know, a lot of women um, retreat backwards and hope that they'll be recognized. And um, I was coaching one only this week saying, no, no, you are leading this. So don't say, well, I didn't do it. You've got to say, I set the team and the environment and empowered them so they could do it. They weren't doing it before I came. They're doing it because of my leadership. So you've got to put yourself into it. And um, I don't like generalizations, but many men have learned that skill and most women need to learn it. Excellent advice, thank you. Right, we're going to take our next question from Caleb. Uh, again, just want to thank you for all your work, Professor Dame Sally. Uh, my question is, so since the emergence of COVID-19, we've seen a substantial increase in the use of antibiotics to treat secondary infections related to COVID-19. Um, recent research has found that of those patients receiving antibiotics to treat the secondary infections, a small percentage of them were subsequently confirmed to actually need the antibiotic treatment. So what do you think the UK should do to combat this increase in, uh, in AMR that we'd expect with this increased use of antibiotics? And do you think the UK should change its approach for potential future pandemics? Thank you. That's a really important question. And we're all worrying at this. And in fact, Public Health England at the moment, I understand, are collecting the data to really look at the overuse. So I think we have to start by recognizing that for clinicians, facing a sick patient, it can be very difficult, particularly if the patient clearly has a chest infection. And you think it's probably COVID, but you don't know, is it COVID? And originally, the results were taking quite a long term around. And even if it is COVID, is there a, a superimposed bacterial infection? We now are beginning to get the data and to know that it is rare to have a superimposed infection unless you're on a ventilator. And in fact, it's only 10, 11% of them that have that. So that experience should help reduce the use. And I'm sure that um, microbiologists are beginning to make um, you know, pathways and guidelines to reflect that. It is a worry. I think it's an even bigger worry when I hear about low and middle income countries and in India where you know, the patients can't get into hospital, so they're given handfuls of uh, antibiotics in India and, and many countries in Africa. The um, consumption rate's going up more. And of course, that absolutely fits with the data that um, Lord O'Neill put into his report, the Independent Review in 2016, and other work that, as AMR gets worse, is going to be worse in the poor countries, the low income countries, than it is in the middle and they will be better than the high income. It's partly the availability of uh, antibiotics over the um, counter in chemists, partly that they don't take the full course, even more difficult availability of tests. But we know there's a problem there. Um, I think the other side of it, and, and I expect we'll come back to that, is of course, 
you could say COVID has taken a focus away from AMR. But what I'm talking about is the fact that this is like a lobster. And there are two ways of killing a lobster. You can drop it into boiling water and it makes a racket, which is incidentally um, kind of the ligaments um, uh, contracting. It's not the pain screaming. And that's what COVID is doing. Or you can put it in cold water and heat it up slowly. You get no noise, but it dies all the same. So I think, you know, we are talking about a slow pandemic alongside the acute pandemic. And actually, we need to use this momentum, and I hope we're going to be able to, to get a focus back on action for AMR. Lovely answer. Thank you. Um, we'll take our next question from Hannah. Hi. So investigations into genuine public interest is difficult, and the media, media rarely have limited resources to conduct these properly. There can instead be temptation to simply just pick low hanging fruit from few statistics and make headlines from these instead. Is there any public interest stories that you've seen from this year that have largely gone underreported that you need, if you feel that need investigating further? Well, I suppose I'm worrying about three big areas apart from COVID and the sadness of that. The first is the inequalities and how the people who are most affected and the highest death rates are in people from poor backgrounds and who are overweight and obese and who um, come from ethnic minorities. And I think those stories have been picked up pretty well. I think the next worry I have um, is, and it's not been picked up, is there are two sorts of death from COVID. There's the direct death patient has COVID, they die of COVID or COVID related. But then there's all those patients who are not getting health care and are dying. And if you look at the excess deaths, and I was looking at it with a young colleague um, uh, on Tuesday, uh, all the way through the year, you can see the ones that are related to COVID and they're, and they're high and they're, they're near what is um, what's announced on the news every night. But if you look at the um, Office of National Statistics, ONS data, you see the excess deaths from non-COVID are as high or higher. And those are people who couldn't get access to cancer screening, cancer treatments or cardiovascular, or that might well have been able to, but they were scared to because they thought, oh dear, I have comorbidities, so if I go to the hospital for a test or for treatment, I'll catch COVID. And actually, early on, I think there was a risk of that, which has gone down with time as we've learnt more about COVID. We've got, um, I hope, adequate PPE, et cetera. So it's not just the COVID deaths that we have to worry about, the, the direct deaths. It's all of these deaths um, and community deaths have been gone up dramatically. That might not be a bad thing. Many people would prefer to die at home, but they're excess deaths. They're people who wouldn't normally have died because they didn't get the health care that we would have wanted to give them. So I think that's a big story. Um, well, you can tell me, were you aware of all of that? And, that? and have you seen it in the press? I've seen very little except, you know, the odd allusion to it. No? Yeah, the it's something that's reported, but probably something that could be reported on more. Um, but obviously there are things that are seen in the public eye that has a lot more attention. Yes. And I think that's a pity because until we put the stories in the public eye and show them that now they should be seeking the help that they need, we're not going to change that. It's going to go on. Um, and so we do need those stories out there. Well, the other stories I'd really like, and they're not particularly COVID, um, are the stories of people getting ill, uh, suffering or dying of antimicrobial resistance. I mean, I think we'd make a lot more progress if only we had a human face to this, if only we had patients and families battling for it. And that's what all the comms people, the newspapers and the uh, television people say to me, look, Sally, you've got a good case, but it sounds terribly technical. 
where's the patient or the bereaved family to talk about it? And they do exist, but they're difficult to find. And why are they difficult to find? It's almost a conspiracy of silence among the doctors and nurses. I and mean, it's not intentional, but you know, you go to a patient's bed and you say, oh dear, your infection isn't responding to this drug, so we'll give you another. Or you say to the family, well, we tried our best, but we didn't get on top of that infection and your auntie died, you know, or granny died and this happens and it's tragic and I'm so sorry. But people don't say that bug was resistant. That bug that was resistant, we didn't find an effective treatment. Your granny died because it was resistant. We don't say that. It's not often put on the death certificate, so there are ways to put it on. It's quite complex and not often put there. And I think that is the big story. We don't, then the media would pick it up. So it's not that I want the media to do it. I want the health sector to talk about it with patients and families, and then it will have a face and it'll be picked up. Interestingly, Cancer Research UK is beginning to pick up on some of this cystic fibrosis um, society really recognize the importance. So I think we're beginning to get there, but it's taking time. And the medical and nursing profession have a lot to answer for. We could do a lot more on it. Our uh, next question, uh, very timely indeed, uh, comes from Lisa. Thanks. Uh, so in 2019, the World Health Organization named vaccine hesitancy as one of the top 10 threats to global health. As the world waits for a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, what should organizations like FSFAM be doing to right now to try to help promote confidence in vaccines? They also, WHO, put antimicrobial resistance and a pandemic in that top 10 uh, disastrous risks for the world. So three of them have come to pass. Maybe some of the others haven't. I'd better go back and look. I think just promoting the fact that we wouldn't license a vaccine without the proper data. This has been fast tracked, but not um, skimped on the work. What I understand the MHRA, our regulator, has done instead of their normal process of regulating by having one team look at this lot of data, then that lot and that lot sequentially, they had a number of teams looking at the same time who kept talking to each other and then brought it all back together. And hey, if we can do this now, this is great for the future of medicines and vaccines. We can do it faster in the future. But you know, to emphasize that the proper processes have been gone through, that people have worked their um, socks off, that's the a safe one to say, isn't it? Work their socks off to get us here this far. They have not uh, skimped. They have not cut corners. I mean, when I'm told uh, there's a vaccine for me, I'll be along. Hey, of course. I'll be right behind you. Yeah. Anna, um, another question from you. Going from the first female CMO to the first female minister of Trinity College, Cambridge, is another step in a great career of firsts. How have you found the shift from working in public health to in the government to academia? And do you still face the challenges of the difficult people? Huh. Um, my parents were academics. Uh, and of course, I set up the National Institute for Health Research. So I'm pretty used to academics. But I hadn't been in Oxford or Cambridge. So college life is new. And there's lots of fun. Um, and I'm getting used to um, all these erudite people who not only know their su own subjects, but are happy to opine many of them on all sorts of things. It's entertaining. Uh, and I meet wonderful people. I'm enjoying it. Do I miss things? No, I think I was very lucky to dodge the bullet of COVID. And I think my successor has not only 19 years more energy than me, but he is an expert in infectious diseases and he's doing a good job. So just a quick follow on from that, uh, James Sully. Um, you've obviously been all over the world. Um, is, where, where is it that you would still like to go to? And, and is there anything particular that you wish you'd been able to do sooner? Huh, if you'd asked me um, 
just over a, a year ago, I'd have said Bhutan, had I'd been, and it's every bit as wonderful as I hoped. I'd still like to go, I've been um, once, well, a couple of times to Latin America. I'd like to go to Chile and down to uh, Tierra del Fuego and up to the, um, the deserts and things. Um, yeah, but I love Asia. I love the culture, the food, the temples and everything. So I'll go back to Bhutan. I'll go to Tibet. Yeah. Sounds good to me. Caleb. So um, you act as the UK special envoy to antimicrobial resistance. So I was interested to know how the pandemic has affected your work in that role, as well as are there any issues the pandemic has raised from an, an insider view uh, around AMR, other than the, we discussed the, uh, the treatment of secondary infections earlier? Well, I think it is bringing infectious diseases to the fore. I mean, I can remember a CMO telling people, you know, it, it'll, it, we will get a pandemic, likely flu, that's what we planned for, and it will kill people and it'll damage the economy. Phew, I don't think even I realised what damage it could do and how big it could be. So it's brought infectious diseases back front and centre stage, and we've got to use that to get action on AMR, the slow pandemic. So not only are we reframing that it's a pandemic, but a slow one, we are also talking about antibiotics, not just as global goods, but as infrastructure for every health system, human, animal, plant health system. Anti-infectives are essential. You can't run a health system, even if you've got clean water. The theater without anti-infectives, whether they're disinfectants or anti-infectives um, or even vaccines. You can't run it. So we're trying to reframe. And I think that the uh, pandemic is giving us a push to do all of that. But uh, in, in addition, what the pandemic has shown us is that we don't have transparent, sustainable supplies of, for health systems, whether it's drugs, vaccines, PPE, and that we're going to have to build those. We have, as you probably know, stockouts of antibiotics from time to time. We can't always get some of the older antibiotics that would be really useful. Um, the same in low-income countries. So all of that needs addressing. And I think COVID has really put that at the front uh, so that we see it now and everyone recognizes we have to sort out um, the supply chains and they have to be sustainable because people are beginning to understand how much some of these factories emit of their antibiotics or APIs into the environment and how damaging for the future that can be. Okay, thank you. Right, we're, we're, we're coming close to the end of our time, uh, but before we go, we'll take one final question from Lisa. Thanks. Um, just want to ask your opinion on um, with declining trust in governments and social media channels increasingly gaining prominence as a main source of information, particularly for younger demographics, do you think uh, things like social media platforms should be required to add disclaimers um, for false information and point readers to accurate and verified information? I think they not only should do that, where they know it's false, they should take it down. And I appreciate but if they do that with um, man hours, it's very expensive. But come on, AI can help them do that and flag them. Um, but I also think that social media can be a movement for good and they can do a lot of good. And we've uh, set up the Trinity Challenge that brings together tech companies, including social media and academics to work on how we can be better prepared using data and analytics better for a future pandemics. And we're looking at things like vaccine hesitancy. And there's no doubt that the social media firms do want to do good in this area, but they need help to understand the best way to do it. And the, you know, we need some consumer pull. We need the public to say, we shouldn't have to put up with false posts. We shouldn't have to put up with false news. We want truth. We want to know that what you push in towards us is correct as the science goes at this time. 
absolutely. I think that that really is so important to get the public behind and um, good use of social media. So listen, that, that brings us to the end of our time, Dame Sally. And um, so I want to, on behalf of S Farm and, and all of our members, thank you very much for taking the time to, to chat with us this afternoon. Um, we've, we've had some fascinating insights and uh, we very much look forward to seeing your work progress on AMR. And we wish you the, the best of luck with everything that's coming in the future. So thank, thank you, you Claire. That's really kind of you. Thank you, Robert, for running this and all of you for your questions. You are our future, your generation. So it's lovely to spend time with you. And all power to your elbow. You can sort this, even if I can't. But I promise to do my best. Thank you. <laughs>